What's going on, guys? Ted Fayton, the host of the No Rain, No Rainbows podcast here. Just wanting to give you a heads up that this episode includes some explicit words in the delivery of the message. But that being said, I still think it's a message worth sharing. I hope you enjoy the episode. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the No Rain, No Rainbows podcast. As always, it's truly a pleasure to have you today, and thank you for taking the time to join us. I know we have a great episode in store, and I am excited to introduce you to author, speaker, coach, but most importantly, warrior, Michael Anthony, aka Michael Unbroken, author of Think Unbroken, joining us on the call. Thank you so much, Michael, for being with us today. Yeah, brother. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as I like to do at the beginning of the episode is always giving the opportunity for our audience and the guests to get acquainted. And I like the guest being able to introduce themselves in their own words and, and tell their story really quick. So please get acquainted with the audience and, and let them know who you are and, and what you do. Yeah, totally. Um, I'll give you the elevator pitch here. So we're not here all day. Um, but when I was four years old, my mother, who was a drug addict and alcoholic, um, she actually cut off my right index finger. So that starts to give you baseline for everything that you're about to hear. And people always go, well, how could your mom do that? And I'm like, well, because it was the continuation of the perpetuation of trauma. She married my stepfather when I was six, super abusive, the kind of dude you praise never your stepfather. He kicked the shit out of my brothers and I put me in the hospital, right? Spent the majority of my childhood homeless and deeply in poverty. In fact, lived with 30, three zero different families between eight to 12 years old. My grandmother adopted me when I was 12. And you'd be like, oh, that's awesome. Finally, somebody rescued that kid from the chaos. But I'm biracial, black and white. And my grandma was a super racist ass old white lady from a town in Tennessee you never heard of. So insert identity crisis. And I got high for the first time when I was 12 drunk at 13, expelled from school for selling drugs at 15. By the time that I was 18, I got put into a last chance program, still did not graduate high school on time. They were like, dude, we are so tired of you. You have a 1.6 GPA, miss a hundred days of school, getting in fights and suspended. We're done with you. You're out. And I was looking at my life and I was like, what am I supposed to do? What is the solution for trauma, for abuse, for homelessness, for poverty, for all of the chaos? And I was like, oh, it's money. Obviously, that's the obvious answer. So I was like, all right, cool. I want to make $100,000 a year legally by the time I'm 21. The legal part was super important, Ted, because I knew where I was going. I've been in handcuffs multiple times. I have family in prison for life. And as of today, my three childhood best friends have been murdered. So I knew I had to go and figure out what was next. So I just started learning skills and I got a job at 18 being a general manager in training for a fast food restaurant, had 52 people under me. I'm like a little kid, like leading the row. Right. And I find myself by the time I head into 21, I cash my first check for $10,000. I'm working sales for a fortune 10 company, no high school diploma, no college education. Cause I got really clear about my goal and what I wanted. And then that thing that happens to people who get money for the first time happens to me. And let me just tell you this, to, to age myself, I was spending money. I was living paycheck to paycheck, making six figures, going to the mall, buying Jerbo jeans, Sean John suits and J's, right? All sweatsuit. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Look, I'm aging myself. I don't want to tell people, but you get it. This is two thousands. Right. And so I hit rock bottom. I was 350 pounds, smoking two packs a day, drinking myself to sleep, cheating on my partner. And that's when I put a gun in my mouth. I was done, man. I was like, this money was supposed to fix everything. And it didn't. And the next day I'm laying in bed. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. Keep in mind, I'm 350 pounds. I'm smoking a joint, eating chocolate cake and watching the CrossFit games. Like, dude, if that's not rock bottom, I don't know what is. And for whatever reason I got up, I'll never understand why. And I walked into the bathroom and I looked at myself in the mirror and I remember being eight years old and the water company had come and turned our water off. Now our heat, heat was getting turned off. Our electricity was getting turned off. We were always getting evicted. Like, remember I live with 30 different families yeah. and this one day water company comes and turns off the water. I go in the backyard, I grab this little blue bucket, walk across the street to the neighbor's house, 
turn on the spigot on the side of their house. And for the first time I stole water. And I remember being like, when I'm a grown up, this will not be my life. And it wasn't financially, but it was in every other way. Cause I was still that hurt, lost little boy. And as I stood there in the mirror, I asked myself, what are you willing to do to have the life that you want to have? And the answer was no excuses, just results. And 11 years later, here I am talking to you. Now in that process, there was a ton of therapy, group therapy, EMDR, CBT, men's group therapy, you name it, going and getting trauma-informed education. I have over 30 certifications in trauma education, going and getting a coach, personal development. I was the dude who wouldn't spend $6 on a book. And yeah. last year I spent 60,000 on personal education. That's not a flex. I promise you. And today I'm super fortunate dude, because life has led me to where I'm supposed to be. And I run multiple businesses. I coach thousands of people around the world from, from moms and dads and teachers and coaches to Facebook executives. I've been able to work and speak on some of the biggest stages. I spoke in front of 10,000 people with Grant Cardone, right? I've been able to do things in my life because A, I put myself in a position to get out of my own way and B, because when the universe calls you to do something, if you show up, your life will be different. And so today it's an honor. I get to coach trauma survivors around the world. Tens of thousands of people listen to my podcast every single week, thousands of books and the whole nine. But ultimately it's really about one thing. One thing, can I end generational trauma in my lifetime through education and information so no one else has to have a story like I just told you? Michael, um, first, thank you for not only sharing your journey, but enduring your journey. Because a lot of times people ask, why am I going through this? And you are the embodiment and the example of we go through our trauma. So maybe someone else doesn't have to. And the fact that you just shared that story, I hope one of our listeners, one of our viewers needed to hear that. And I, I don't wish for them to have to relate to that, but if they can, um, I, I hope they can see themselves in you and, and see that as, as a path to that recovery and that turnaround. One of the notes I did write was that mirror moment, right? For so many of us, it takes so long to get to that mirror moment. You mentioned being at rock bottom. A lot of us get to rock bottom. Some of us make it out of rock bottom. Some of us don't. Why do you think it's so hard for us to look in the mirror and why do we avoid it so much? That's an awesome question. You know, I, I think the truth of the reality is from the time that we're very young, we're taught to not be ourselves. Think about this, Ted, when you're a little kid, little, imagine a little Ted, seven years old in second grade and Miss Smith comes up to you and you're sitting there, you're coloring, right? Got a house with the grass and the sun and you make the sun purple and Miss Smith put her hands on your shoulder. Ted, that's not how you do the sun. The sun is not purple. I don't know why you're doing it that way. And all the kids hear that and they go, oh, that's fucking Ted. He makes the sun purple. Don't hang out with that kid. And then suddenly what happens is you learn to turn yourself off because it's safe. Because when you're not being you, you're not exposed to ridicule. And so you bend yourself. This is what's fascinating. You bend yourself so that other people like you while simultaneously sacrificing your essence because it's a survival mechanism at its most foundational. Because when you look at the human experience without community and being ostracized, survival is almost not possible. And so you're in this position where your reptile animal brain is telling you, don't get kicked out of the group. And that serves you, right? That serves you until it doesn't. And then you're 18, 24, 37, 72 years old. You don't know how to stand up for yourself. You don't know how to say no. You don't know how to move towards your wants, needs, and interests. You don't have values. You have no moral character. You're operating day to day. You hate your job. You hate your relationship. You hate your everything in your life. All you do is blame other people. And then you find yourself at 350 pounds smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Yeah. The reason why you can't look in the mirror is because you've been disallowed being you. 
Dude, the most dangerous thing I could do as a kid was have an opinion. The fastest way for me to get thrown through a wall or punched in the face in my own home was to have an opinion. And then you stack that with the educational system that removes critical thinking from you. Walk on the right side of the hall, raise your hand to go to the bathroom, eat lunch when we tell you institutionalization. And then you go to college if you're so lucky or if you choose to or into the workforce. Be on time or we're going to write you up. What the fuck is that? That's the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my life, right? And so you're in this position where all you're ever doing is what other people tell you to do. And so you're always in conflict. You're always questioning who you are. And when you look in that mirror, you turn away because you know the truth. And the truth is terrifying to you. And the truth will set you free. I know people say that, and in passing, they don't really hold on to it. But your truth will give you freedom from the matrix of the society that you live in, that you have allowed yourself to be constructed into. Mm. And so the way that you move through that is you look in that mirror and you get serious about your life. And you ask yourself, what are you willing to do to have the life that you want to have? And I'm telling you, if the answer is anything short of no excuses, just results, your life is not going to change. But in that, you're going to have to face your fear. I want to say that again, because you really need to hear this. You're going to have to face your fear. You know what to do. It's that thing that's keeping you awake all night. You haven't slept in seven days. You're exhausted and you won't pull the fucking bandaid off. Mm. Well, guess what? Your life's not going to be different until you do. And facing that mirror is the hardest singular thing I believe a human being will ever do. Because when, and I don't mean like, oh, how's my hair look? And your hair is fine. Nobody cares about your hair. I'm talking about that moment in which you stare into your soul and you recognize that you're lying to yourself. Because guess what? You can lie to everybody else, but you can't lie to yourself. It's like the silence is the loudest thing we could hear. Nothing is more terrifying than being alone when you don't like who you are. Yeah. When you're staring in the mirror and, you know, taking us back to 11 years ago, like you mentioned, the joint, the chocolate cake, watching the CrossFit games, and you're in that mirror, we kind of jump to where we are now, which, which is a beautiful contrast, right? And there's a lot of people who have that vision of where they want to go and they haven't put their current destination in the GPS. So they can never figure out how to get there. Where does the healing start? What's that first step? They've done the scariest thing. They looked in the mirror. They faced themselves. Where does the healing start? Yeah. By doing that thing that's calling you. Like it really is like, there's, there's a part of people always ask me, well, what are you supposed to do at the beginning? That thing that, you know, you're supposed to do. <laughs> right. I, I remember this like yesterday, man, I was like, oh shit. Next time I go to therapy, I need to actually be honest with my therapist. Mm. I was going to my therapist, paying this dude hundreds of dollars a week to lie to him because it made me feel good about myself. Right. Mm. Well, that doesn't help anything. I was drinking every single day. Hmm. All right. Well, how's that helping? I was smoking two packs a day. Are you kidding me? Hmm. All right. What's that doing to my body? I was eating garbage. Okay. Maybe I need to stop doing that. I was showing up for work late. I was getting stoned in the morning in the car on the drive. I was eating Wendy's McDonald's. Oh, I'm going to get sued. I was eating fast food every <laughs> single day. Every single day. You know, fast food is bad for you. Discipline, Ted is the first thing that you do. You discipline your life because you never have and it's out of control and you're in chaos. And the only way to get out of chaos is with massive amounts of clarity and discipline. You're gonna have to get an alignment with where you're going. If you're sitting here like, oh, I'm gonna go to therapy, like you need a purpose. You're gonna go coaching, you need a purpose. The gym, quitting smoking, what is the, why are you doing this? Because that's the only way you're going to continue to do it. Dude, think about this. I've been, I've been running Think I'm Broken for six years. You just learned who I am, right? Why do I do this? Because I have this North Star idea about the world I want to create. And so it's never, people will be like, man, you're a workaholic. You work seven days a week. I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to accomplish a mission. It's not workaholism. I am dedicated to something bigger than me. 
you know, and you go back, you know, 700 years, 2000 years, people worked on Sunday. What are you talking about a weekend? You didn't even do anything all week. What do you need a weekend for? Like, it's about clarity. You you're waiting for Monday. And I'm like, right now, yeah. you don't get tomorrow. Stop acting like tomorrow is coming. Cause it ain't. Because one of these days you're going to run out of tomorrows and you're going to be on your deathbed. And I promise you, you're going to have regrets. And that to me is a life unlived. So the first step is getting real with yourself, asking yourself, what do I know I need to do? I'm not asking anybody what I need to do with my life because I already know the answer. And that's where you start. I think that's, that's the thing in terms of finding that connection, that purpose, and knowing that nobody is in control but you. You mentioned the fast food. I can relate. Uh, our, our listeners know about my ulcerative colitis journey that landed me in the hospital. I almost lost my large intestine. And when the doctor came in and asked me, hey, you know, this is, this is an autoimmune disease focused on your digestion. What's your diet been like? My audience knows I was eating 20-piece chicken nuggets, large fries, sweet teas three times a week. I was depressed. I was stressed. I was drinking my sorrows on the weekends, and I was a recluse during the week. And when the doctor looked at me and said, if you don't change your habits, not only are you going to lose your in large intestine, things can get worse. I had to make the change in that hospital. And when I was leaving the hospital, I talk about driving back home down a road I've always seen, a road I've been there hundreds of times, but the grass was greener, the sky was bluer, the clouds a little whiter and puffier, and my mindset was different. And that mindset is really what kind of led me on the path that took me into TV, took me into where I am now, starting this podcast, No Rain, No Rainbows, because I've gone through my storm, found my rainbows, and I've had a lot more storms along the way, but here I am pushing forward. Now, the biggest thing that changed for me was mindset. And a lot of times people are so locked into their mindset, they're so convinced of their reality, they can't even entertain something else. How do you work on shifting that in somebody? Yeah, look, there's you can't see it because it's in front of me, but there's a giant sign that says mindset is everything. Actually, I think I'm, I just moved. I think I'm gonna put that on this wall because mm -hmm. I want people to see that because mindset is everything. But here, here's the interesting thing, Ted, nobody ever tells you what mindset is. And you know this being around personal development, everybody's like, mindset, 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 mindset. And you're like, okay, well, what does that mean? I'm gonna tell you what it means because when you understand what I'm about to say, it'll change your life forever. Mindset's very simple. Mindset is this, what you think becomes what you speak, what you speak become your actions and your actions become your reality. And some of you are talking to yourselves in ways that if you said to me, you would get punched in the face and you're expecting yourself to be successful. You're putting poison into your mind that comes out of your mouth. That becomes the way that you operate in the world. In the same way you were going to the fast food. I was too, man. I was like, why should I eat healthy? Like, who cares? Why does it matter? So then what do you do? You eat like crap. And then what happens? The doctor goes, oh yeah, by the way, you got ulcerative colitis. Doctor tells me, oh, by the way, you have C. diff and you might die because of your diet, because of what you're doing to yourself. Oh, great. So you mean I did this to myself? Yep. And so here's the reality. When you want to shift into growth, you have to be willing to accept a couple of things. One, failure is inevitable. So you might as well get comfortable with it and stop hiding. With that failure, you're going to learn. And in learning, you are going to grow. But the only way that you're going to be able to navigate that effectively is by first accepting the reality that you are not being kind to yourself. The number one thing I teach every one of my clients, first thing, day one, I say, grab a pen. This is the most important thing in your whole arsenal. And you're going to write this down. And you're going to convince yourself that this is true. And on a long enough timeline, I promise you it will happen. I am the kind of person who is kind to myself. Mm. I am the kind of person who is kind to myself. And people will listen to me and be like, man, you're super intense. What do you mean by that? I operate through a scope of kindness in everything that I do. I ask myself this question, Ted, what would a kind person do for themselves today? You are more likely to bend over backwards for somebody else than you are for yourself. Mm. 
You cheer harder for the football team than you do for your dreams. And you're expecting success. You're asking for it. And then you're blaming people when you don't get it. It's your fault. But when you operate through a scope of kindness, you go, hmm, what would a kind person do? You start thinking about it and you start saying it and then you start acting like it because what is a kind person going to do? Hmm. I shouldn't eat fast food because it's going to make me sick driving down the street. Oh, there's my favorite spot, man. They got that two for four today. Hmm. Kind person would not do that to themselves because I'm trying to be healthy. So I don't die. So I can walk my daughter across the aisle on her wedding day. Hmm. Action. I drive past the fast food place. That's how this works. Mindset is everything. Yeah. When the dream that you're reaching for is more important than the indulgence right in front of you, it becomes easy to drive past that two for four. It becomes easy to eh, take your take your behind over to the gym, maybe start with a 10 minute workout, 20 minute workout and the consistency over time, because like you mentioned, you have a goal, you have a mindset and something that you're going for. And the dedication means you're not taking a day off from it. You're kind to yourself every single day. You're not kind to yourself Monday through Friday, 40 hours a week. Dude, I don't believe in the weekend. I don't because that's where people screw up. Mm -hmm. Dude, that's where people mess up their lives. Ain't nothing better than going and getting trashed on a Friday night. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. And here's the thing. Because one thing I I wrote down about the vortex or kind of like the spiral, and I know a lot of people who you ever see the picture of the guy who carries his bike up the hill on Monday, Tuesdays on the top of the hill, Wednesday starts riding down on Thursday, on Friday, he's happy. Saturday, he's enjoying the ride. And then Sunday, he picks up his bike and then lifts it up again. And it's just this circle about the progress we make throughout the week. We undo it on the weekend. And even when we kind of try and take ourselves out of this situation, we dedicate ourselves for maybe 20, 30% of the week. But we still hold on to these bad habits that don't allow us to, to kind of get out of the rut that we're in. Explain what, I guess, your concept of that vortex is, that spiral that keeps us from really breaking free towards that dream we want to go towards. Yeah, people are terrified of success. Mm. People are terrified of the idea that they could have what they want. And because of that, we sabotage. Because again, you grow up in the society that tells you you're not good enough, you're not strong enough, you're not capable enough. Ted, how dare you want to be a news anchor? What's wrong with you? (laughs) Boy, get out of here, right? And you hear that stuff, right? And your friends go, oh, that dream, that's so crazy. I remember the first time I quit, I quit a Fortune 10 job to go and start my first business. Everybody was like, dude, you're crazy. How could you do that? You don't even have a college degree. What are you going to do? You'll never get a job after this. In this economy? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I'm like, your thoughts about failure have nothing to do with me. Mm. I refuse it. And the vortex, that place where people get stuck is because all they've ever heard is you're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not capable. And then they tell themselves that. And then the moment it starts going good, they destroy it all. Mm. Why? Because it's ingrained in you. It's embedded in you, enmeshed in you, groomed in you from the youngest of ages. Again, this comes back to where we started. You know, you're in this school, you're in this house, in this community, in these friends groups. People don't want you to be successful. Why? Because they're scared of it for themselves. And then guess what? That rubs off on you, right? And then you're scared of it. This idea about you are the sum total of the people you spend your time with is so true. I look at the people and it's not that I don't love them. It's not like I didn't have my season with them, but I look at the people who were in my life for the first half of my life. And I look at the people who are in my life now, and it's very, very different. Yeah. Not even in the same ballpark. And those people, you look at them, they're doing the same, dude, they're literally doing the same thing we were doing when we were 18 years old. It's not different. I spent this weekend that I'm not flexing. I need people to hear this. I spent the weekend having dinner with three billionaires. Mm -hmm. I'm a poor kid from the hood. Who's not educated. Make a decision about your life. Put yourself in the right position. That vortex only goes away by facing the difficulties of life and investing in yourself. 
You're so terrified to buy a book, but you'll go cop some J's. You'll get your nails done. I will take, I'm going to, look, I'm going to say this. I will take someone who is full of confidence and dead poor because they invest all of their money back into themselves over someone who hates their life, drives a Lamborghini and cannot stand the look of their self in the mirror. Mm -hmm. You've got to be willing to invest in yourself and grow and work through the chaos of your life. Because if you do not, your life will not be different. No material. Trust me, dude, I bought an $85,000 car when I was 21 years old. Do you know any other 21 year olds who did that? I don't. You know what that brought me? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. $500 dates, nothing. Pop my friends in limo, go to the hottest club in town, spend three grand in a night. You know what that brought me? Nothing. Today, I'm like, where can I get that book? How can I invest in that conference? How much is that airplane ticket? How much do I need to pay my team? What do I need to do to grow this business, to grow my reach, to learn, to grow, to change? You've got to change the way that you're thinking about yourself in the world, because if you're only leveraging this idea of playing the victim and woe is me and tied into the money trap and not investing in yourself, nothing in your life is going to be different. And I'm not trying to make people feel bad because of where their life is. You've been set up for this. Mm -hmm. you're doing exactly what they told you to do since you were in third grade, since you were in kindergarten, since college, since you got the first corporate job, since you showed up to the assembly line, you've always been doing what people tell you to do. You want to get out of the vortex. You've got to face the fear. You've got to let go of whatever that thing is holding you back. You've got to do the work around it. You've got to be willing. Look, without darkness, there is no light. There is a yin and yang to the universe. And you are going to have to let go of something to get what you want. Mm, man, You're crushing it, by the way, man. <laughs> it's just with, true, man. <laughs> it's just true. They need to hear this. And, and, and the, the reality is, is when you mentioned you, you started the healing journey, I'd like to know what it was that that helped you overcome what unfortunately so many would have succumbed to. Um, I it hurts hearing that you've gotten to the point of a barrel in your mouth, but I am so glad that you've gotten past it. And there's a tragedy of people who don't get past that. And what was it that helped you pull back out? And you mentioned the five people you have around you or whatnot. I also want to encourage people to know you're not supposed to do this on your own. You're supposed to do this with a team, with a coach, a mentor. So how did you build those life rafts that eventually got you back to shore? Yeah, dude, I actually love that you said that because what I always try to tell people is you are the GM, you are the general manager of your life. I'm going to use a sports reference mm -hmm. and you're the general manager of your life. You have one mission, right? What is general manager's job? Win a championship. How do you win a championship? You got to hire the right people. You got to have the coach. You got to have the quarterback. You got to have the linemen. You got to have the wide receivers. You got to have the DNs, the tackles, the, the linebackers, the whole nine, right? But you got to have support too. You need the personal trainer. You need the, you need the acupuncturist. You need the therapist. You need the team psychologist. Like, like I'm not saying you got to go put 80 people in your life, but I am saying you're going to have to build something around your life around people who can support you. And so when I started this, the first thing that I did was I tapped into education because I realized that, so this really funny story just happened. So when, when Eckhart Tolle's book, A New Earth came out for the first time in 2005 or something like that, my roommate's girlfriend gave it to me. And she was like, I really think this book will help you. She saw something that was chaotic in my life that nobody else called out. Like she was way ahead of her time. And, uh, and I threw it in the trash can. I was like, what the fuck am I going to do with this? This dude doesn't know anything about growing up in the hood and being homeless and running from cops. Some white guy on this book. What am I going to do with this? And so I go to the Goodwill last week because I'm like, I want to find a book. The Goodwill is an amazing place to buy books. I promise mm -hmm. you. Y'all are paying $25 for books. I'm paying two. <laughs> <laughs> and I go to the library because they're free there. Yeah. I was like, I want a book to sit and read. I'm about to have this surgery. I need to sit and recover. I'm going to get this book. I walk in. Sure enough, there it is. Eckhart Tolle, brand new copy, looking like the day I threw it away. <laughs> Spine hasn't even been cracked on this thing. My brain is like, this is the book that I threw away. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and the truth is education is at the crux of this. 
you have to be willing to learn. What's really fascinating about growing up in school or for those of you who went to college and even corporate jobs, like I got, I got a I got Franklin Covey certifications. I got the Sigma six, blah, 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 all that crap. Right. And when you have that structure to learn, you learn because they tell you that's what you have to do. But then when you're actually in real life, <laughs> nobody tells you this. No one says you need to go and learn. Nobody gives you a syllabus for life. And there's no instruction manual for this. I don't know if you got one, but I didn't. And so I'm sitting here like, okay, what do you do? And so I just started looking at the people in the world. And this is in that moment. You have, I'm, I'm getting to the point of your question. This is in the moment of trying to figure out where to begin this process. And it was very much, okay, let me go and learn. Because I don't know how to work out. I don't know how to eat right. I don't know how to take care of myself. What do I need to do? Well, one, I stopped playing video games so much. Like video games was 30 hours of my week. Like Diablo 2, like for those who know, man, that thing <laughs> sucked me in. Yeah. And, and it was crazy. I remember I looked it up. I had logged 400 hours playing that video game. Sheesh. That's not, dude, that's not even that much. There are people with so much more. Ask yourself this. If you're a person who your best day is you get off of work, you come home, play video games from 5 to 11, go to sleep, rinse and repeat that, play video games all day on Saturday and Sunday and get trashed every single day on the way there. That's a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of dreams going down the toilet. And so by going to education, what I did in the beginning, I just said, who's kind of like having the life that I want. And it was an entrepreneur's this was early. Nobody was really doing podcasts. Like that wasn't really a thing. Then you could find some streams online and some forums and stuff like that. But generally speaking, there were no podcasts, but I started finding these small entrepreneurial shows like entrepreneur on fire with John Lee Dumas. And then I started, who's one of my mentors, an amazing human being. And I started listening to people on his show and I'd be like, Oh, how can I find out more about them? And then I just started mimicking modeling and mastering them. I started getting in, intertwined in them. I started learning from them. I started investing into them. And people will ask me all the time, well, well, how do you have a mentor like, like Tom Billy or Grant Cardone in your life? And it's like this, it's this acronym I came up with team, time, effort, energy, money. You want something in life, you're going to have to invest one, but chances are you're going to have to invest all four. And so think about how you're spending your time. Where are you putting that energy in your day to day? Is it in video games? Is it in unproductive things? Again, what do you need to give up to have the life that you want to have? Mm -hmm. Is it energy? If you're tired because you've been eating fast food, you're eating snacks all day, you're over caffeinated, you're not sleeping, like, yo, how are you going to have the energy to create your life? Effort. You are not putting in enough effort. Dude, even me right now, I'm looking at my life. I'm going, I'm not doing enough. I'm not <laughs> doing enough. I'm Same. not going hard enough. No. And, and I'm like, yes, I've written three books. Yes, I have an award-winning show. Yes, I've done all these things in the world. And not putting in enough effort and money. Look, I know it's scary to invest money. We live in this society that says save for a rainy day. For what? It's raining right now. Your life isn't what you want. Go and put that money, go to a, I dare you go and spend $500 to a personal development course. The first time I gave somebody 500, Ted, I was freaking out. I just spent $500 to get coached by this dude. I was terrified. I was like, this is the most money I've ever given somebody. And that started the process. And then that 500 became so much more because when you, here's, what's interesting too. I'm not wealthy. I'm not rich. I'm not, I'm a poor kid from the hood who just figured some stuff out, but the, I have a theory. This is not proven yet. Give me 27 years, but I have this theory for every $1,000 that you invest into your personal development, you will make $100,000. Ooh. I have nothing to base this on other than a theory. Yeah. Right. And so time, effort, energy, money, you want something in your life. You're going to have to invest one, but you're probably going to have to invest all four. Hey, got to be committed. Got to be invested. And when you're invested, you're least likely or you're less likely to walk away from it. Um, we're coming up on our time, man. I wish we can go on and on and on. Cause I feel like we just scratched the surface. Um, one of my last questions is what does it mean to be unbroken to you? 
So when you die, I love when people ask me my own question. When you die, one of two things are going to happen. You're going to look at your life in the flash, that last breath, and you're going to be okay with it, or you're going to have regret. Mm. And having regret is a life unlived, and nothing terrifies me more than that. Mm. And for me, being unbroken is very simple. It's living life on my accord, doing what I want to do because I want to do it, not doing what I don't want to do because I don't want to do it, living authentically, whether you like me or not, and showing up every day to be of service, to show people that no matter what you come from, you can be the hero of your own story. Man. With that, I would love for our audience to be able to connect with you, Michael, um, and follow some of the work and the amazing podcast that you have and the guests that you interview how can people connect with you on social through your personal links and, and get in contact with you? Yeah, brother. And it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm everywhere on social at Michael Unbroken. Um, and you can listen to the Think Unbroken podcast if you go to thinkunbrokenpodcast.com. Awesome. And I'll have those links in the show notes. And just to wrap up everything you said really quick in terms of the notes I've, I've been writing down and just so the audience knows for maybe the first time uh, ever in the history of this podcast, I was running out of notes, uh, space to write my notes. There's, I'm maxed out here, but just to kind of give the rundown in case you guys didn't uh, capture some of the content or some of the, the value that Michael left along the way is first, you need to face your fear. You need to look yourself in the mirror, sit in that silence and find out really truly what's calling you and what it is you want. Then you have to put that wager on there. What are you willing to sacrifice and give in order to get that life that you want? And you need to start the healing process by being honest with yourself. And as Michael said, hey, you know what you need to do. The first thing he says, I need to go to, back tomorrow and be honest with my therapist. Mindset is everything. Mindset is the connection into why you do what you do. Be kind to yourself. By being kind to yourself, you're less likely to eat that junk food, which deteriorates your energy, which limits your ability to go after that life that you're already putting on the wager after you faced your fear. I'm kind of going through these notes as fast as I can because you guys need to get as much of this as possible reiterated. We are terrified of success, so we end up sabotaging ourselves. You might have heard the thermostat analogy where we think we're 75 degrees, and once we get to 80, we turn ourselves back down because we don't want to live life too hot. Turn up the heat, go to 80, go to 100 if you want. Keep on pushing. And of course, your thoughts. Think about your thoughts because those are important. But your thoughts about failure mean nothing to me. When you said that, man, a lot of people need to hear that because your circle will hold you down. And then lastly, lastly, team, time, effort, energy, and money. You might need to invest one or two or most likely all of them to get the life you want. Michael. Thank you so much for being on the show today, man. It's my pleasure, my friend. I appreciate you. Absolutely. And to the audience that made it to the end, thank you. We appreciate you. Please share this with someone you know that can get value from it. It would mean the world to us. Leave a rating too if you can. That's the only way we can grow and get better. And of course, we have a new episode every single week. So be sure to subscribe to the podcast. And if you love it and you want to support monetarily, be sure to join our Patreon page to hear some extra content from Michael and some of our other guests. As we always say at the end of the episode, guys, everybody wants the sunshine, but they don't want the rain but you can't get the pleasure without first the pain. Let's grow.